got it. There, got it. <laughs> so um, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, we're gonna talk about putting some life in your landscape. Um, just to start, I'm gonna say full disclosure, this talk is about adapt adopting sustainable practices. Um, it is about using what you have, but it's more so thinking about moving to a more sustainable system. Um, sustainable landscapes, well, what are they? They improve the environment. They conserve resources, reduce chemical inputs, and preserve and support natural ecosystems. Um, as we've developed more of our land mass, we have lost biodiversity and the ecosystems that support life on Earth. So while we um, can't stop development, we can change our landscape practices to reverse this loss. Um, it is a challenge to combine ecological functions with aesthetics, but it can be done. And um, think about some of the new trends in gardening. Um, one is like often called the new wild, but um, the gardens like uh, the Highline Garden in New York City, Lurie Gardens in Chicago, and other um, gardens who have um, taken on trying to use more native plants and a more um, in a more natural setting. The bottom line of uh, decisions that we have about our landscape impact the natural world. So what do we want from our landscapes? Well, we do want good looks and value. We want an attractive, welcoming appearance. We want functionality. We want space to do the things we like to do, space that we need to function. We want manageability. Uh, we need to be able to take care of what we have. And hopefully we also want sustainability. We uh, need to do all these things with ecosystem benefits, preserving biodiversity, using water wisely, um, and reducing carbon emissions. So at the top, um, good looks and value, what you want, I mean, one of the ways to assess your own property is just to go out at the street view and just like you would be taking a realtor photo, just take a look at what you see in the frame. Is your entry obvious? Is it welcoming? Um, how about your trees and shrubs? Do you have too many, too few? Are they out of scale, out of shape, not healthy looking? Um, are the foundation plantings away from your house and in scale? have uh, what I call interlopers popped up where they don't belong? Are there bare spots due to compaction from say foot traffic or too much water, too much shade? Um, one of the quick fixes is first just to clean up your edges. Um, when you do that, it's just tidy looking and it's um, it just gives a crispness. It makes it look like even if it's a naturalized landscape, that someone's caring for it. Um, assess your trees, shrubs, and foundation plantings. And here is an example of a house that uh, there's a lot of things growing along here. In fact, when it's summertime, you can't even see the front of the house. Uh, but right now there's just a lot of trees that have popped up. And yes, there's this one lonely, very tall tree in the front yard. So it looks a little barren and it looks a little messy. And here's another example of a tree that's a huge tree that's just like right on the edge of the house, which is not a good thing for many reasons, um, in terms of too much shade on the roof, um, the roots of the tree can be growing into the foundation, um, better if the tree is moved away from the house. And at this house also, the shrubs are basically out of scale. They've grown too big for the setting. So if you have trees and shrubs that are totally out of scale, they just may have to be removed. And then particularly if they're too close to the house. Um, large planting beds with a mix of shrubs, small trees and perennials can tie together that one here, one there look. And that uh, photo of the first house with the very tall tree, if that were an island bed with 
several shrubs and perennials that offer different layers, it would look better. Um, your foundation plantings, just as a maintenance issue, shouldn't really touch the house. You should prune them away um, or switch to smaller, smaller plants or use, you wouldn't even need foundation plantings in the ground. You could use containers in season and then in the winter time, just switch them out with like evergreens. Um, and again, maintain foundation beds by removing stray seedlings. One of the things about many foundation beds is that they're just not wide enough, if, especially if they're between the house and the sidewalk, they're really not wide enough to support a very large plant. And back to my interlopers is what I call them, our invasives, but we have this kind of a large um, juniper shrub here, and it has a oak tree that's been growing in it for a few years because this is, this is not a tree that's been here just one or two years, it's bigger than that. And there's also bittersweet, this vine that's growing through this. So on your property, you don't want things to be that out of place. So the tree really has to go, the bittersweet and the vine should be removed. And this is another more manicured yard where we have a nice maple tree. And what we have growing here is, um, I believe this is a Japanese honeysuckle, which was most likely planted there by a bird. And of course it's planted right on the base of the tree. So even though I talk about using islands like this here with some trees and shrubs, you wouldn't want this to be right on top of the tree. And then the other point about this too is it is an invasive plant. And as we'll mention later, we want to remove those. And looking around your yard, if you see bare spots, <clears throat> if they're due to compaction, consider using a hardscape like stepping stones or permeable pavers um, in that spot. Because if it is a traffic area because of the flow of um, the flow of the traffic through your yard, it's, it's not gonna get better. <laughs> um, if it's due to water and erosion, consider a rain garden or a swale where you actually prevent the water from running across it and running off your property, but rather slowing down the water so that it can percolate down into the aquifer. If it's a bare spot that's under trees, which is usually because it's just too shaded and there's too much competition with tree roots for water and other nutrients, then instead of grass, use a green mulch, like a native ground cover um, to make a landing spot or just use a lot of leaf litter or natural mulches under your trees. It's not harmful to mulch your trees clear out to the drip line. So it can be a huge spot under a tree. So, Moving on to functionality, this is the, this is the beginning of any uh, landscaping project. It should really be to sit down and answer the question, what do you want from your yard? Do you want space for activities? Do you want to play games? Um, do you have extra vehicles that you have to have room to park? Do you have pets that need a place to play? Do you want a space to entertain? Um, a patio, a fire pit? Do you wanna sit on the patio and be able to look at beautiful flowers all summer long? Do you want a good view out the window? When you're in the kitchen working away, do you wanna be able to look out and see something really nice out there? Four seasons of the year. Um, do you want to have vegetables or grow vegetables, herbs, um, or have flowers and pollinator gardens? Do you want to attract uh, wildlife, birds, bees, butterflies? Um, and another function would be to mask a less than attractive view. So as you're thinking about your different functions, you're going to want to plan this out. Um, think about a bird's eye view or a top-down view of your house and start with the functions you've identified and the landscape features that you have. 
and think about um, the areas that you need to achieve those functions and how you'll be moving from area to area. And you know, what can be a bad, what can be play area and so on. Um, consider your orientation, like what direction does the front of your house, back of your house face? We all know that West sun is very, very warm. The South is going to get more sun. The North is gonna be cold and have a more harsh exposure. Um, then plan your areas around your needs. And example of this like might be if you have um, say a view across the, at the next house that you don't particularly like, an island bed with a mix of evergreen shrubs, small trees and perennials would make a good blocker. And it would also provide four season interest. And it also would provide shelter and food for birds, um, bees, butterflies, and other uh, creatures. Manageability um, is no matter what you hear, there is a no, no care property. I mean, there's all kinds of things, easy care, this and that, but no matter what, it still requires some care. You need to think about how much time and interest you have. Um, will you do it yourself or will you outsource some of it um, or outsource it all? And key to this also is can you reduce costly inputs? Things like water, uh, fertilizer, gas for the mower. So I'm going to go through some steps to do what I call put some life in your lawn. First off, and pet peeve of mine, um, is to reduce, reduce your turf grass and ease up on lawn care. Um, I, it's astounding how many acres and acres of lawn um, we see that's just nothing but just green grass. And it's just, um, unfortunately, grass just doesn't provide any little um, provides little or no value, habitat or value for wildlife. Um, a manicured lawn requires intensive management and use of resources, things like water, fertilizer, pesticides, and fuel. Um, the root systems of turf grasses are too shallow to effectively filter stormwater runoff, and so they don't really help you keep the water on your property. In Southington, um, from 1985 to 2015, the surface area of turf grass increased from 13.5 to 15.5%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 2% in that 20 year period. Now, that has not been done again, but if I were to think about what today the percentage might be, I would think that it's probably, it's at least another 2% and probably even more. America has 40 million acres of lawn overall, and we use 3 billion, billion gallons of gasoline each year to maintain it. That is a problem in terms of the environment. The other thing is the gas is just the beginning. We also use a ton of water and a lot of fertilizer. And now with fertilizer being in short supply and not necessarily even being available for the farmers who need it for their crops, it seems a little ridiculous <laughs> to me to be using fertilizer to, go, to grow grass that you just have to mow more often, which uses more water, and then you still have to get rid of the grass clippings. So instead of lawn, trying to get you to think about some alternatives. And this first picture is something called a bee lawn. It's a, it's a mix of clovers and grasses and other plants that are allowed to grow about six inches, something that you would only have to mow about once or twice a summer. No, it's not your velvety green turf, but it is uh, a lawn that has 
function for the ecosystem and provides uh, food for pollinators, and it does use less resources. Another thing you can do instead of lawn is to use more beds and just use lawn for your paths in between. And in this picture, this is Pennsylvania sedge, which is an alternative um, to grass. It's a sedge, it really probably might be mowed once a year. Um, it doesn't necessarily withstand a lot of foot traffic, but it's a beautiful soft covering that can be used um, instead of uh, regular turf grass. The other thing is there's many fescues that are more durable than turf grass and take less inputs. And those are an option um, for a lawn too. And then of course, by shrinking the lawn and putting in beds, islands and swaths of plantings, this is gonna cut down on your amount of turf grass. So the reducing turf grass and the inputs that it takes is just is a key step in a more sustainable landscape. So minimize turf to only what you need. Um, you might need it for play areas if your kids play soccer, want to play badminton, croquet, those kinds of things, cornhole. Um, yeah, you'll need a space for yard games. And if you have pets that run the yard, you'll need a space for pets. Otherwise, use it to create the white paths through your planting so you can move from area to area. Or use it to move the eye to features in the yard. But um, think of it as an area rug versus wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Changing your lawn management practices can also help reduce inputs. Um, keeping your yard at three, mowing at no less than three inches means you will mow less often um, and the grass will hold up better. Um, mulch clippings and leave on the grass to naturally feed your lawn. If you apply fertilizer, um, only do it around Mother's Day and Labor Day, not between April, um, 15th and not before April 15th and not after September, if at all. So in other words, like not, <laughs> not the four-step program. <laughs> Use slow organic, um, organic slow release fertilizer and um, don't apply fertilizer before a rainstorm nor over water after applying because if you do, a lot of the nitrogen, instead of soaking into the ground, is going to run into the storm sewers, which eventually, for us, runs into the Quinnipiac, which eventually runs into Long Island Sound and, and contributes to the pollution there. Another thing about your lawn is tolerate um, some things like violets, clover, and other plants in your lawn. Um, and wait as long as you can in May to begin mowing. Some of you have seen the meme that, uh, you know, no mow May is uh, one of the themes that's used to encourage people to let their lawns just grow in May and have some flowers and things for pollinators, the bees especially early. Okay, step two is plant native. Um, The, the ultimate goal is to aim for about 70% native plants overall in your landscape. And that includes your trees, shrubs, perennials, grasses, and ground cover. Choose your plants with care. Um, you know, you want them to thrive. So it's, it's, not, it's not just like run out and buy something, but really think about what you want to plant and how you're going to do it. You can use plant identification apps to figure out what you have in your yard and if they're native to the region. There's many online resources where you can look up your plants and figure out whether they are natives um, and um, or invasives for that matter, but and uh, what their cultivation needs are. Right plant, right place is key. Because you want, when you invest in plants, you want them to thrive. And the, re, the way they thrive is if they have the right conditions. So 
need to assess for whatever space you're going to be putting your plant, what's the light condition? Is it full sun? Is it full shade or somewhere in between? Um, what's the soil type and moisture? Is it a well-drained soil? Is a moist soil? Or is it just almost wet and boggy? And there's directions online for doing percolation tests where you just basically dig a hole and pour a certain amount of water in it and just monitor how long it takes for that water to go down. Um, in terms of space, how does big does the plant get when it's fully grown? So our tendency is when we have a space and we get a plant, we want it to look full. So we buy a big plant, but then the plant go, grows and eventually becomes too big for the space. So for some things like perennials, that's fine. You can divide them and move them around. But for some things like shrubs, it's really hard to continually prune a shrub and um, keep it small. In terms of plants, trees, trees are really important, especially for birds but and pollinators and for environmental services. Um, should cherish your old trees for their cooling shade and their ability to hold water on your property and to store carbon. Um, you know, many urban tree initiatives, tree planting initiatives, really one of the first things, one of the benefits of that is it just reduces the temperature in an urban environment as much as like 10 degrees in the summer. So it's really, Trees do offer a lot of benefits. And trees have, especially our big and older trees have really um, taken a hit the last few years between storms uh, and storm damage, but also uh, because of the storms and storm damage, our tree trimmers have gotten ahead and preemptively you know, cut down or cut back a lot of the bigger trees because they don't want them to cause storm damage. And also I personally in my own neighborhood know two neighbors who took beautiful, a big oak and um, another tree, which I can't remember the name of right now down because they wanted their yards to look better. So they cut the trees down in order to have more grass. Um, so please don't do that. <laughs> Cherish your trees. Um, if they don't look well, call a licensed arborist and have them assessed and see if they're healthy or not healthy or if they you know, need something to um, need something to make them healthier. Um, you don't want to have a, a tree that is at ri a risk to your house on your property, but most trees live for many, many years. Oaks, cherries, willows, birches, cottonwoods and elms are known as keystone species, but these are the trees that have the most value for the environment and for the, especially for um, our birds and pollinators. When you, when, you want both tall trees and understory trees in your yard. And again, right tree, right place. Large trees should not be planted within 20 feet of a structure. They shouldn't be planted where they're growing under wires unless they're very small trees. So you want to research before you plant. And I wanted to say another thing about trees is that uh, because there is like encouragement to plant more trees, oftentimes we see seedlings. Um, these are just little tiny uh, one stem trees with just a tap root. And you think it's just too little to plant. It's not gonna add to your yard, but no, that's a perfect tree to plant. Um, it will grow. And you know, over the course of a few years, you will have a small tree that gets bigger and bigger. So um, moving on to shrubs, um, native flowering shrubs and conifers have beauty and ecological benefit. Um, using miniature and dwarf versions, these will grow more slowly than the full-size plants and thus be less likely to overgrow their spots. So if you feel 
determined to have foundation plantings. Oftentimes dwarf versions um, or miniatures are, might be better specimens for that situation. Understory trees and shrubs and a border can be very attractive backdrop. And again, they can be a screen, um, again, something that's not so desirable to look at when um, some of them are evergreens. And there's many, many uh, native shrubs, inkberries, winterberry, blueberries, which also have a food benefit if you can keep the birds away, uh, mountain laurel, native rhododendrons, witch hazels, uh, sumacs, junipers, many plants to choose from. And moving down to our, in our uh, plantings to a lower level, we have perennials, ferns, and grasses. Um, these can be planted in mixed borders to add color and texture to the landscape. In terms of value, um, there's host species such as milkweed, which are necessary for the, butter, the milkweed caterpillar to consume in order to turn into a chrysalis. It's a, it's a necessary plant for that. So host, there's other butterflies have different host plants like fritillaries have violets and spicebush swallowtails have spicebush. So plant some of those host species so that you'll get some of these butterflies on your property. But anything that blooms that has pollen available is offering nectar and food for your pollinators. Um, try to include plants that bloom early, mid-season, and late. Things like um, especially goldenrod, asters, and sunflowers are of special benefit because they start to bloom at end of summer and they provide food for migrating um, insects and butterflies and creatures uh, late in the year. And another piece of advice there is to plant in a large swath, not just one plant, but several plants together. Ground covers um, are our lowest layer of our planting areas, and they're especially effective under trees as pupation pupation sites for caterpillars and to eliminate the need to mow over tree roots. So you can have like what's called a green, uh, green mulch um, or a living mulch under your trees. And they will grow in a lot of leaf litter, but there's many um, examples of native ground covers and that could be creeping phlox, um, the native geranium or crane spill, wild ginger, violets, ferns, uh, green and gold, which is also known as chrysogonum, Crested iris, bearberry, asters, creeping junipers, coral bells. It, you know, your, your growing conditions where you want the ground cover will depend which of these will thrive there. So be intentional in your plantings. Um, definitely research first and consider both your goal and your site conditions. Um, your goal might be just to have a bed that um, isn't grass. It might be that you want a pollinator garden, uh, but think about you know what it is you really want to do. Use uh, resources since such as the Audubon's or Native Plant Trust, Native Plant Finders to determine the best plants for uh, your area. Visit nurseries throughout the growing season too, not just the spring, to see what plants are available. And native plants are becoming more um, available in nurseries, but you may have to ask for them and encourage the nurseries to carry more. When you go to a nursery, plants are really marketed to provide happiness. And it's often with little consideration to cultural requirements or to ecosystem value. I mean, they're stunning and you go in and you look and you see them and like, of course you want that plant, um, but try to be a little more intentional in your planning about plants and think about what is this going to, how is this plant going to contribute to the ecosystem in my yard? So three, remove the invasive plants. And this is a tough one. It's a, 
it's a talk all its own. Uh, but for those that don't know, invasives are introduced plants that spread to natural areas at the expense of natural plant communities. Um, Verney bush, and, which is a euonymus, and Japanese barberry are examples of invasive plants that have often been planted in yards. Even though they've been identified as invasive, they have not necessarily been prohibited from being um, in the nursery trade. And so many people have these in their yards. Um, Japanese knotweed, mugwort, oriental bittersweet are examples of invasive plants that I say simply appear. I mean, they were obviously brought there in one way or another. And these, these plants, um, they're invasive because they're just so readily propagated. Um, with mugwort and especially just walking around in a mugwort area, you can bring mugwort um, bits and pieces back to your house and have it growing in your yard. The same thing with knotweed. It only takes a little fragment of knotweed to start growing knotweed. And bittersweet is one of those that the birds eat the berries and they drop them wherever. <laughs> um, to find more out about the invasive plants, the, the main website is um, CIPWG, C-I-P-W-G, Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group at uconn.edu. And if you go to that website, it not only gives you the list, it also has many, many links to help you identify the plants and uh, practices to help remove them. This is just a couple examples. Um, this is a barberry that's in a, a plant landscape. And it's, sorry, the picture, this is dark barberry, dark barberry. This is one of the barberry cultivars, the deep red one that was sold as being non-invasive. But as you can see, it's reverting back to its basic green form and thus it's probably going to be spreading around. And this. This is, believe it or not, a huge euonymus, a burning bush. And all this green under here is baby burning bushes. Now they won't necessarily thrive underneath this bush, but it just goes to show that if a bird eats this seed um, and then drops it somewhere, how readily available it is to grow. And this is the curb of the street. And this is a Japanese knotweed that has taken root in that little bit of dirt that's in the crack and it's growing. I've been watching it grow for the last couple of weeks. I probably will chop it off soon. <laughs> but this is, just, this is just how readily these invasive plants can take root and grow anywhere. So check your yard and try to remove your invasives. Another step is not, don't use pesticides and minimize fertilizer. Pesticides can be harmful to insects, birds, wildlife, children, and pets. If you have a pest problem, research non-toxic ways to deal with it first. Um, and one of the things that you can use is like the Yukon Master Gardeners um, phone number and just, or email and just call them up if you have a pest problem and they'll offer some um, non-toxic ways to deal with it. Um, it. One of the things that's easy to do uh, without using any kind of chemicals, just basically pick off the pest and put it in a can of soapy water. This is like especially useful for like things like Japanese beetles if they're eating your plant. But sometimes too, if it's a caterpillar who's eating one of your plants, you wanna make sure it's a pest caterpillar or is it actually a butterfly that's trying to form a chrysalis? So need to um, research your pest and see what it is. And also it's okay to tolerate a little damage to a plant. Sometimes a pest will hit it and it will do a little damage that's not gonna kill the plant and then another insect or predator will come along and take care of the first one. Um, in terms of fertilizer, test your soil before you plant to determine if amendments are needed. 
feed your soil by leaving leaf mulch and grass clippings and adding compost is preferable. For most, most North American native plants, they do not need um, supplemental nutrients. Now, if you do a lot of container gardening and you do do vegetable gardening, yes, you will have to feed your vegetables. And if you have, especially if you have animals growing in your containers or even animals growing in your ground, they probably will definitely bloom better if you use a little bit of fertilizer, but keep it um, local. Um, don't just apply broadcast fertilizer to everything out there because most things just don't need it. And use water wisely. Um, lawns require more water than other landscape plants. So to conserve on water, again, shrink the lawn. And when you water, water deeply, but less often. Um, design your landscape to keep water on your property. Um, use a rain barrel. Um, use a rain garden and use plantings to prevent runoff. You want the water to slow down and sink in to your soil. And also that leads to maintaining a healthy soil because a healthy soil that has an adequate amount of like organic matter in it will retain water and filter out pollutants. And use mulch, including leaf litter, to reduce evaporation from the surfaces. And focus water on new plantings and containers. Established native plants don't need that much water. And I added this one in, leave the leaves, because I'm always talking about it. But in the fall, when your leaves come down, leave some of your leaves. I'm saying some, not all. If you don't have many leaves, you can leave all, but it's fine to leave leaves on your ground cover beds and on your islands. Um, you can even leave a little leaf leaves on your grass areas, your small grass, hopefully small grass areas. You can put leaves in compost. You can pile leaves um, in the landing spots under trees, but leaves are good food and shelter for butterflies, beetles, bees, moths, and more. So, and then in the spring, we still say leave the leaves until about this time of year, because this is when the bees, the beetles are emerging, the moths, they're emerging out of the leaf litter. If we rake it away and chop it up, we're going to be raking away and chopping up our butterflies and our moths. So we don't want to do that. So tolerate leaves as much as you can. So do what you can do. I mean, basically, if you follow your interests and concerns, uh, you'll find your way. If you love pollinators, uh, see the pollinator pathways in Xerces Society's resources. Go look at pollinator gardens and decide to put one in your yard. If you love wildlife, um, look at the National Wildlife Federation or Audubon sites. National Wildlife Federation has um, certified backyards. If you meet certain requirements, you can have your backyard be a Wildlife Federation certified backyard. If you're a plant geek, um, check out the Native Plant Trust resources to learn more about plants. If you think you need a rain garden, uh, the Yukon Nemo site has a very um, helpful guide to building a rain garden. And if you're into sustainable landscaping, the University of Minnesota has a, a wonderful series. And, that, and I have to say, in Minnesota, there's some interesting things. Like they're very into doing the bee lawns and they actually are paying people at their homes to rip up their turf grass and put in bee lawns. So because um, because it reduces the environmental impacts that turf gra grass have in terms of clean water um, and also less pollution from mowing. And also just learn more about gardening. Um, become a master gardener. The Yukon Master Gardener Program has 
is already underway for this year, but there'll be a new program starting uh, next January. Uh, join a garden club. You can join our garden club. We have monthly talks uh, on a variety of different topics, but we also have hort report, horticulture and conservation reports monthly. Um, and join the Southington Land Trust is another opportunity where you can actually see um, conserved land and you can also get out and see uh, what it looks like in terms of uh, what natural plant communities are, how invasives have taken over and take field trips. Um, there's native plant gardens such as Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Mass, which is just a beautiful uh, all native plant garden in the, in the woods. And they also sell native plants there. Another native plant garden is the one at the New York Botanic Garden. They have a whole native plant area now, which is beautiful. Um, visit native plant nurseries such as the Earth Towns native plant in Woodbury, Connecticut, but there's others as well. Take a walk in the woods and see how Mother Nature designs. Um, you know, you can learn a lot just by looking at, well, what plants are growing where it's wet? What plants are growing where it's dry? Um, and also, when you walk in the woods and you start to see Japanese barberry and uh, Japanese honeysuckle and euonymus springing up everywhere, it just drives home how invasive, how much those plants can spread around on their own. Uh, you can visit pollinator gardens and there's many of those. There's um, on the linear trail, there's the Art for a Cause garden. There's our garden club's small little pollinator garden. In Cheshire, there's uh, one right near Route 70 and there's also one near where Brooksville Road crosses the linear trail but there's many others too. And I say, if you want inspiration, read Doug Tallamy's books and they're all on um, the reference list. But Doug Tallamy uh, tells the story about how our environment has been degraded in a way that it's really understandable. We wanna help uh, a sustainable landscape. We want to create a place where both people and nature can thrive together. So now I'm going to take questions and I'm going to flip the screen because I am unashamedly advertising our garden club's plant sale to you as well. <laughs> so are there questions? I don't see any questions in the chat yet. There are people, a couple of people commenting about lawns. Um, it is hard for some of us to give up all of our green space. So, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> and the new aesthetic, it takes time for, yeah. uh, it takes time for you to change your idea of what's ideal. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way. Yes, yes. We do have uh, most of Doug's Ptolemy books at the library, uh, including his uh, last two books, which are probably um, his most well-known books, the, the book about oats, which yeah. I've forgotten the title of. I can't Nature's believe. Best Hope and yes. um, and the, yes. the, the one on oaks, but yes. actually bringing nature home yes. is um, We have is that one as too. well, yes. Yeah. Uh, we have a display up at the library of landscaping books, many of which are about sustainable gardening, gardening for climate change, and we have several books on um, sustainable lawns or uh, rewilding your front right. yard. So um, if you're not sure how to go about that or want to read more on those subjects, just come to the reference desk and we'll, we'll sort you out. Um, let's see. Oh, I, someone wants to know about landscaping on a hill. So usually you want to have plants that are deep rooted that are going to um, hold, you know, prevent erosion. I mean, that is, 
you know, one of the things that you can do. The other thing is terrace um, and terrace with some hardscape. That's, that's another solution, but it, you know, it depends on the grade of the hill and is it an issue with water going down the hill because you might need a rain garden at the bottom of the hill to sort of um, hold that water and let it percolate into the ground. Um, there's also trees that can be planted on a hill like that that tolerate um, if it's wet or, you know, that are going to hold the soil if it's, it might not necessarily be, you know, have a lot of water runoff there, but terracing and steps are definitely um, a hardscape, you know, option to mix in with some plants that are deep rooted and that are going to hold the soil. So there's also a question about what are some native rhododendrons? So the rose bay is the native rhododendron and it's, um, I, if you go to uh, Native Plant Trust Plant Finder, you can actually um, look the because like the genus and species is like is, I forget if it's the maculata or which one it is, but the common name for it is rose bay. And I I know this is this isn't. There, there'll be a whole talk on native plants, but it is, it's a tough issue. And Laura, you can chime in on this too. When you go to the nursery, sometimes you think, oh, that's a native plant, but no, it's the Japanese version of um, yes. what is native to here. Because do you think about, I mean, plant collectors hundreds of year, hundred years ago went all over the world and collected plants and brought them back and they've been, um, let's say they've been bred, they've been um, hybridized to create specimens that have more pleasing shapes, more pleasing flowers, double flowers, different colors, all those kinds of things. And so when you go to the nursery, sometimes you don't really know whether, you know it's rhododendron, but is it a native rhododendron or is it not? Mm -hmm. um, Katie, the... Um the con has a database too i don't know can you hear me yes okay the native rhododendron the um uh, uh, name is rhododendron maximum maximum and as far as native species are concerned what is available you're right a lot of them are native ours they're cultivars of native species not straight species which is not necessarily to say that they're not desirable but they may not be as desirable as the straight species. Um, so you do have to pick and choose and, and do a little research. You know, quite often I just um, take my phone out and Google the, uh, the name of the plant and they'll tell you whether it's a, a cultivar or, um, mm -hmm. or an actual native species. There are a few other questions in here. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I could look now. Uh, th somebody mentioned that there's a Doug Tallamy Zoom presentation tomorrow from 6.30 to 8. Um, if you can listen in on that, he's an excellent speaker. Uh, Doug is a, um, a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware, and he he's, uh, talks all over the country about the importance of transitioning your yards to more native plants. And somebody, that's actually another question on the chat. How much of a difference is one property owner going natural? Um, and what he says is that, I, I can't remember the figure, but it's in the 80% range uh, of property in the United States is privately owned. It's not right. state, state owned, it's not federally owned. So yeah, if we, if we have, uh, changes in our own backyard, and that's multiplied from backyard to backyard, it can make a huge difference. Uh, he calls it, what does he call it? The homegrown, homegrown right. National Park. Yeah. Homegrown National Park. 
Um, and I wanted to point out that the 70% native plant rule that you mentioned earlier comes from Doug's research, actually some of his graduate students research. They did a study down in the Washington DC area um, with uh, chickadees, you know, a very common bird. And what they found was that if your plant biomass in your yard or your neighborhood falls below that 70%, chickadees cannot raise their young. They require enough caterpillars to feed their babies and the caterpillars require native plants to complete their life cycle. So, you know, if you don't have enough native plants, you're not gonna have birds. I'm gonna say, uh, Doug Tallamy also has talks on YouTube. If you search YouTube for his talks, he has some there that you would not necessarily have to um, pay for. Um, and, but it would be interesting to hear one that's geared towards bees, I think, because, you know, bees are, and I didn't even say, talk about it, but native bees, I mean, we've all heard honeybees are, you know, dying and honeybee diseases and things like that and trying to save the honeybees, but really we need our native bees to be our pollinators too. And we need to, we need natural habitats to support our native bees. And I've been noticing a lots of uh, bumblebees in my yard this week. And it's, you know, it's like, I'm always excited when I go out there and see them buzzing around and they're in my pulmonary and eating away. Uh, the, another question I see is a uh, large area of invasive how to rid this is cardboard cover successful so depends on the invasive <laughs> it depends on the invasive and that's um i i will say that um going to um the sip the sipwick site is um one of the is a good resource um and also just <laughs> you can just at your risk peril almost you can just google it and see what you see but you want to have um, something that's, you know, you want to, you want an answer that's been verified by uh, a Yukon or a, a state school extension or something like that. Um, Kathy Janet, Connelly, Janet speaking, the invasives I have, I think is called a mustard plant. It's long oh, and white flower. The garlic mustard, it's yes. blooming now. It's yeah. uh, got little white flowers, okay. Yep. You know, one of the key things with that is just not let it bloom. Cut off those white flowers and, um, or pull them up and bag it and put it in the trash. Um, the problem is, is that over the years, like those flowers make thousands and thousands of seeds and they reside in your soil. So it's probably gonna come up year after year after year. But the thing is, is like, if you pull, it's easy to pull up and, um, Again, just bag it, throw it in the trash and kind of keep at it because it's, it's gonna keep popping up all summer long. But right now it's especially noticeable. Uh, and I, you can't I, eat I, it if it's, in a, you know, if it's in a safe spot. I mean, people say, use it as a salad green, make pesto out of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I, would, I would say of the invasives you mentioned, garlic mustard is one of the easier ones to eradicate, but it does take persistence because of the they seed. Do. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it, it doesn't have running roots. So it's not going to pop up in other places. And it's not going to undermine your foundation. Like, um, uh, um, oh, I can't think of the word. Um, a bittersweet root. <laughs> well, it's not going to bring down your trees like a bittersweet wood. Bitter, yes. And I, I meant to mention off. that. The, especially um, getting the vines out of your trees is, is um, it, it creates a hazard because if you have vines in your trees, when the winds blow, they're, they're less able to, uh, you know, go with the flow and they're more likely to come down. So yeah. I've been the most successful getting rid of the garlic mustard in my yard of all the invasives that I started out with. So you've got a good chance there if you keep at it. Thank you. Ooh. Yes, and we had, there's a comment about the kayak paddler too, um, and that 
the hill spreading juniper yes spreading juniper would would probably work to stabilize a hill and yes aquatic um invasives are also a problem and i tend to think of the terrestrial ones first because i garden as opposed to paddle but yes definitely the aquatic ones are problematic as well Is there any way to discourage suckers from our weeping cherry tree? Um, that I do not know. Laura, any, do you? Yeah, no, I, not, not without harming the tree. Uh, all you can do is prune them off and um, mow underneath the tree or you know, mulch underneath the tree and mulch then them. Suck yeah. back. Yeah. Well, that was something I wanted also to add about mulching under trees. Um, one caveat for mulching under trees, especially if you're not using something uh, light like uh, leaf litter or a living mulch, but if you use bark mulch, just avoid the mulch volcanoes. I, I drive past trees that are mulched right up to the um, bark, right up to the trunk, and you know about six eight inches high on the trunk. And I know that tree is going to die. You know it encourages girdling, uh, where the roots grow in a circle around the trunk of the tree instead of spreading out. When you're mulching a tree, you should still be able to see the root flare. If, you, if, if all you can see is the straight stem and you can't see the root flare, you've got too much mulch on that tree. Yes, you don't want to mulch against the trunk, but you can, you can mulch out to the drip line or beyond yes. if you want to. I mean, that is definitely one way to just cut back on lawn and um, sometimes mowing under trees is a frustration because if they have lower branches and things, so just mowing kind of solves, you know, putting the mulch down and not having the mow solves that problem. Right. I, ju I just mean not too thick. That's what right. makes the mulch Especially, volume, yeah. you know, when it's up like this against the trunk and it needs to mm. be out far enough so that you can see the flare of the roots. But yeah, you can mulch quite far out. And in fact, one of the one of the important things to encourage caterpillars for the birds is to have some uh, un, unturfed areas under a tree because they pupate up in the trees and then they fall to the ground for the next part of their life cycle. And if it's turf, they don't survive. Yeah. Doug Talamy calls those landing spots. Uh, uh oh, now what, what is Bill talking about with bamboo? Bamboo. Mm, I don't know what you mean by that, Bill. Um, bamboo is, is an invasive species too. There are clumping bamboos, not running bamboos, but I believe there's a law on the books where if you plant bamboo and it runs into your neighbor's yard, you can get an $800 fine. Yes, I think you're also nope. supposed to plant it like in a, you know, in a metal container or a barrel or right, something right. to keep it from running. Oh, um, he's talking about it undermining foundations. Foundations, yes, yes the, indeed. The one I was trying to, to pull to my brain was the Japanese knotweed. That, that stuff will undermine foundations. As you could see, it was growing in the in curb. The curb in the curb, you know, it undermines pathways. It's, it's vicious. It looks beautiful when it's blooming in the summer, but yeah. it is vicious. And mugwort, I didn't say it, but mugwort is one too that oftentimes gets started in a yard and then it gets, um, it gets mowed and it just, it just, it starts to spread and it's, it's really, really difficult to get rid of. Um, because of those underground roots. You know, right. You leave spirit. one little fragment and it comes right back.
but if we all take care of the, the uh, invasive species in our own yards, <laughs> I mean, it, it's a, you can't weed the woods and you can't weed the roadsides, but you can take care of what's in your own yard. Right. And that if you join the land trust, you can you can <laughs> help remove woods. them on their land trust properties. <laughs> Janet, you were. Yes, I have a quick question about a mulberry tree. It uh -huh. started out from a bird dropping, I think, like 50 years ago, and it's really tall now and it, the berries fall on my car and it's quite a messy tree. What is the best thing to do with that besides cut it down? <laughs> cut it down. <laughs> cut it down. Yeah. Um, you can't stop it from dropping berries, unfortunately. No. There are some messy trees out there and not the best choices, but sometimes you have to work with what's in your yard. Looks like we've got, we're all set for questions. Huh? Yes, it does look like we're all caught up. All right, so if no one has any other questions, uh, we will see you next month for planting with uh, native plants. And again, you can register for that through our events calendar at southingtonlibrary.org. All right, everyone, have a lovely evening. Um, thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. It, was, it was very informative. Thank you.